From state senators to stonework, Minnesota's capital comes to the state fair, and we bring it to you in this week's Capitol Report. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke coming to you from the great Minnesota get together. For decades, the Minnesota House and Senate have had a presence here in the education building. That presence typically includes appearances by state lawmakers. We thought we'd forego our typical format of delving into serious issues and instead, in the spirit of the festive atmosphere that is the fair, we asked several lawmakers a series of lighter questions. What's the number one distinguishing factor that makes Minnesota unique? I would say our lakes and also having traveled around the country and I'd come back to Minnesota and I'd say there's something special about Minnesota and I call it a pastoral beauty. Neatly homes, things are clean, people are friendly, you have the water and you have the lakes and it, it just and it's kind of that overall thing that I describe. I think Minnesota is unique primarily because of kind of our geographic and cultural location as a, a Midwestern state. Uh, we have this great mixing of what comes from both coasts, but we also have these Midwestern roots that keep us pretty grounded. You know, I'm a civics teacher, um, and I think our trademark amongst other states is our civic involvement, our, our civic legacy, if you will, our civic capital, how people are always amazed at how active people are, our turnout at elections. Representing Duluth, you know, we've had the highest per capita voter, voter turnout for the last three presidential elections in a row. So, you know, that, that cultural fabric and heritage that we've maintained, even as the state has grown and changed, I think makes us a special place. It's Minnesota. It's Minnesota nice. It's Minnesota's lakes. It's Minnesota's, if you don't like the weather in Minnesota, wait 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's our educational system. It's our, it's our, uh, our, our ability to attract people from all over the world. And uh, it's because Minnesota has a lot to offer, so it's Minnesota. Oh, I think it took people, uh, you know, through, through, through my life, uh, you know, as you travel to other parts of the country, you come back and like you're flying into Minnesota or even Rochester and you look down and you just realize who lives there and the quality of people and they're just outstanding. Uh, the legacy of leaders that our state has had through the years, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's really on peril, I think, in any other state in the country. And you can agree or disagree on the partisan part of it, but uh, we got some great people here and some great motivation, great initiative. Uh, that's the core of Minnesota. If Minnesota had one state-recognized pastime, what should it be? What should it be? Uh, probably hockey. I think we had a bill about that a few years ago, but I think hockey is one of those uh, sports that is a little unusual and very, very much a part of Minnesota uh, culture. <laughs> oh boy, you know, I'm coming from Duluth, you know, you'd have to say hockey. I think I'd be in trouble if I didn't go home and talk about that. But, you know, I think it's interesting that, you know, we have the highest number of registered boats per capita in the country. So something to do with water, right? We can cover hockey on the frozen pond. We can cover fishing on the big lake. We can cover water skiing invented in Lake City. Something to do with water. Oh, that's a good question. Kind of depends on what part of the state you live. Uh, I'm in Olmsted County where we don't even have a single lake, so I can't say uh, time at the lake, which is what many of us would like to do. Oh, I, you know what I would hope our pastime would be? Reading. Of course, you know I'm an educator, uh, reading specialist. I think the number one thing, if we have well-read citizens, um, I think that's an important aspect. <laughs> oh my. Uh... I was going to say uh, going to the lake and sitting uh, sitting at a table and, uh, and having a beer. Well, hockey's a state sport. <laughs> so there. <laughs> well, because the lakes all freeze over in the winter time and everybody has to skate around and so <laughs> so it's you know. But there's there's a whole bunch of people who have a different opinion than that. You know, because um, um, we have a lot of trails which you can use bikes on, you can walk on, you can snowmobile on, you can. You can uh, four wheel on, you know, and there's all kinds of lakes, and there's uh, there's all kinds of forests where you get. I mean, there's so many things in Minnesota can do that. One specific pastime would be a difficult one to, to but fishing's probably the pastime that people would come up with the most. 
It's hard to miss these large pieces of stone that dominate this year's Senate booth. They are here to give Minnesotans a unique perspective on what's going on behind the scaffolding at the state capitol. Joining me right now to explain more is Scotty Magnuson from Senate Information. Scotty, thanks for joining us. We appreciate My it. My pleasure, Julie. Scotty, what's the significance of bringing the stone to the Senate booth this year? Well, we always try to do something a little bit different. Anyone who drives by the Capitol can see what's taking place, uh, what you've heard in the news media and such. They don't believe the fact that this, uh, this piece right here, for example, will be totally replaced. Uh, the amount of deterioration that you see, if you look at this piece here, this is what it should actually look like. In my opinion, the most beautiful building in the state and it's uh, a symbol of government and such, and uh, it's, it's very important that we take care of it. And why is it important that Minnesotans kind of understand the scope of this and understand that all, all the depth and the breadth of the work that is being done behind that scaffolding? Well, again, the fact that it's something that uh, I, I think we, can, we often take it for granted, um, and that uh, people just look at the dollar figure and say, oh my goodness, but uh, the, I don't think there's a more important building in the state in terms of what it represents. And uh, there's hardly a person in the state that hasn't visited the Capitol. We had a fifth grader come up the other day and excitingly uh, tell her mother that they'll be visiting uh, this fall or this spring. And so uh, it's something we should all treasure uh, we, we should all greatly appreciate. For Minnesotans looking to travel in state, why should they visit the district that you represent? Give us your 30 second tourism pitch. Well, Big Lake has a wonderful lake. <laughs> So does my other district. So I'm in the east part of Sherburne County, east part of uh, Wright County. And so we have the lakes, but we also have the Albertville Outlet Mall that goes right through. Can you imagine I have the Outlet Mall in my district? That's really fun. And uh, again, just quintessential Minnesota in my district. Well, I live in Eden Prairie, and Eden Prairie is a wonderful community. We lived there, moved there 30 some, about 30 years ago. So I saw it grow up. It's just a wonderful place to live, raise a family. It's got great schools, great parks, a lot of trails. It's a beautiful part of town. So uh, we don't have a lot of uh, you know, uh, attractions from that standpoint, but it's a great place to raise a family. I live in Duluth. That's not <laughs> I, don't need to, I don't know if I have to use up any more than that. No, I mean, I really have just the wonderful fortune of representing a community that people love to come visit. You know, tourism is a major part of our economy whether it's the lake, whether it's our 10,000 wooded acres, whether it's Inger Tower, the train museum at the Union Depot, our historic uh, Civic Center area, the new Amsoil Arena and the Convention Center. You know, when you look at a summer in Duluth, it's Grandma's Marathon, it's Blues Fest, it's Tall Ships Festival, it's the Inline Marathon. I mean, it really is a blessing, not only to live there because it's a wonderful quality of life, but when I'm at the Capitol and need to talk about issues in Duluth, People have been there, they have some sense of my community. So, But we always welcome uh, people who haven't been yet. You absolutely need to come to Olmstead County. Uh, Rochester is one of the towns I represent uh, because, well, we have our state's largest private employer, we have world-class healthcare, we have great restaurants, great higher education, wonderful, friendly people, and I'd suggest they come on a Thursday during the summer for Thursday on, Thursdays on First, where we have a great uh, outdoor festival all day long, every Thursday in the summer. It's, it's one of the three, three T's up there, taconite, timber, and tourism. And so it's a beautiful area for tourists to come. Um, it's not as hot as this. <laughs> we, we have we have way better weather up there. <laughs> and we, and we, and we, and we have and we have lakes and we have we have resorts and we have lots of lots of fun things to do. So um, you can get away from the big city. Probably the best reason for that. <laughs> The State Fair is one of the premier showcases for Minnesota culture and products. If you could add one feature, what would it be? I would say the food on a stick. <laughs> and again, representing like Minnesota, that Minnesota State Fair is the friendly place, social place, clean and neat. 
And if you've gone, and, and as I have, I've been at some other places, it's, um, it's just such a friendly, quaint, representing Minnesota, educational, commercial, farm, uh, very broad-based. So there's something for everybody at the Minnesota State Fair. I think, uh, uh, I guess uh, in some respects, I do miss the fact that they don't do the car racing anymore. They used to do that. And uh, I just think that was a part of the State Fair that was historical and kind of, uh, you know, they just don't do it anymore. So maybe if they thought about bringing back you know, some uh, element of the car racing, that would be an interesting feature. They do more music stuff now at the grandstand. But the car races, when I was growing up, that was always part of the State Fair. You know, I would really come back to wanting to do something around our civic culture, our civic legacy. You know, as we move into the 21st century, I fear that that's something that is eroding a bit in Minnesota. Yes, we're still strong. Yes, we're still a national leader. But, you know, we see it. We see it at the Capitol in divisive politics. We see it in our ability to not reach some compromise and agreement. You know, the folks that were in the legislature in the 70s and lived the Minnesota miracle, you know, have given us warnings about kind of where we're at. And really that comes not from us as legislators, but from we the people. So an exhibit, an activity, something that really reignites that, that flame in Minnesotans, that civic flame of, I'm really proud of this and I want to do my part in carrying it forward. I would like to do more with uh, technology, actually, the latest technology, and maybe I just haven't been to that particular booth yet, but there are so many new things that come out that can make our lives more effective and efficient, that can make government more effective and efficient, and I think sometimes we're, we just need a, a place like the fair to try them out. I'd bring back, uh, I'd bring back Machinery Hill, <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm always fond, and I know they have these, but I'll just mention it anyway, the draft horses. I, I just love big draft horses. That was my fantasies in life, to, uh, to own a big you know, six or eight horse hitch with a big wagon, but they do that anyway. So, but no, I think uh, you know, the, the fair machinery, uh, things like that, uh, that you know, Minnesota's still all about agriculture. I mean, we can talk health care, we can talk a lot of things, but we're an agricultural state, and uh, I think that would, uh, that would amplify it, and I uh, wish they'd bring it back. A dome <laughs> to keep the hot weather out like this. <laughs> Scotty Magnuson from Senate Information joins me again to explain a little bit about the bringing back of the Senate opinion poll. Scotty, it's back after one year at hiatus and you said there is something a bit different this year. Uh, we have essentially had an opinion poll survey since 1987. We did them in conjunction with the House, I think until 1995. And uh, what's different this year is that we are both testing machines for Ramsey County. They had the AccuVote machine for, I believe, the last 13 years. Uh, that has worn out. The company's out of, an ex out of existence. So they're having to choose a new vendor. And our company is ImageCast from Ohio. And the house has, a believe, domain from Texas. So what we're doing is we're giving them feedback in terms of helping them make a decision which one they will end up choosing. And back to the familiar, people tend to know that we have the opinion poll. How has reaction been or what has the reaction been to the questions and as far as turnout this year? Is it good, bad, average? Well, the turnout is down and uh, I think partially the heat. I mean, we did have big fair days on Thursday, Friday, and to some degree Saturday. But the booth turnout has been down. Uh, for example, last year was an election year. Those are usually much larger. Um, but for the most part, people have been in a fairly uh, good frame of mind. They've been fairly content. So that's the biggest difference I've seen. Whereas two years ago was shut down, people were really up in arms. It was not the most pleasant place to be. Um, last year, in election year, people are more engaged, more uh, animated. But um, it, uh, like I said, I think, and part of it might be the heat and such, but people seem much more, more content. One of the questions on the 2013 Senate opinion poll has to do with whether or not Minnesota should allow Sunday liquor sales. 
We caught up with Senator Roger Reinhart to find out if he intends to pursue this legislation in 2014. Uh, I really think that 2014 is going to be a good year to make some progress on it. You know, we've been pulling together a, a group of people that are supportive from citizen activists to store owners, been working with some of the other players that have had historically had concerns and trying to figure out how we can meet those concerns. You know, I think I've worked on this bill enough that people know me as a serious legislator who actually wants to accomplish things and isn't just charging at windmills. And this is a good, a good year. The budget is done and it's set. We kind of know what the bonding bill is going to look like. It creates some space to do some other things. You know, and frankly, the data recently has been pretty powerful. The public uh, policy poll that came out after session, no other item was ranked more favorably than, sun than passing Sunday sales by a good margin. You know, if this fair is consistent with other fairs, this will have a wide majority of support from fair goers as well. So clearly the population wants to make it happen. But one of the things I've been saying back to folks is we need the population to be engaged. It can't be me and a handful of people. Legislators around the state need to hear, need to hear from people in their districts that the time has come. You know, and really the way I've talked about it lately since this session ended is, you know, if we're a state that can have marriage equality, I think we're a state that can have Sunday sales. So the time is now, let's get it done, and 2014 is a great year to do it. Following up on that, you said that you need citizens to be more engaged. Who do you want them to be engaged with, and, and how do you think you can move this specifically in the direction of getting passage? I mean, the, the whole lobbying association is kind of against this, the liquor, you know, a lot yep. of the, the liquor yep. people. The liquor store lobby right. is the number one uh, lobby in opposition. So what we need to do is make good use of social media, um, which is easy to do, and get people to talk to their own legislators. Whenever this issue comes up, I hear from people around the state. It's like, I'm on board. I'm the chief author. You don't need to convince me. What I need you to do is talk to your local senator, your local house member, and let them know that you care, that this just makes sense. It generates more economic revenue and tax revenue for the state of Minnesota, and we can trust people to be responsible for themselves and make the purchases whether they want to or not want to. Um. By being at the State Fair, you are demonstrating to the public that the Minnesota Legislature is an open place. Tell the people why you think it's important that lawmakers hear from them. Well, I think legislators, we're always interested to know what people think, what our constituents think, but people from all across the state. We are trying to, to do our best to uh, write laws and deal with laws that affect everybody. And we need to know what people think, uh, what they think about things that we're doing well, things that we're not doing so well, things that people think that we should do or shouldn't do. And the only way you can do that is when you get a chance to talk to people. During a campaign, we're out door knocking. That's a great opportunity to do that, but you can't do that every year someplace like the State Fair where you get to talk to people, all kinds of people will walk up. It's just a wonderful chance and I would encourage anybody uh, who's out here or thinking about coming out to talk to their uh, local politicians and tell them what you think. I mean, the thing I, you know, again, as a civics teacher, I actually teach my students in Minnesota, you should expect to meet, touch, talk, and, and get to know your legislators. We're part-time. Our districts are of a small enough size where it's pretty easy to get a hold of. You know, I answer my own email. There's not this extensive staff that does our work for us, whether it's here at the State Fair or at your local county fair or in Duluth at any number of events. We're super approachable. You know, we're folks um, that are doing other jobs when we're not here, like me as a college teacher. So, you know, you need to sort of demystify us as legislators and just think of us as people that are taking our turn as citizen legislators. Um, and, you know, in another year or five or whatever, it's going to be somebody else. But while we're here, let us know what it is you're concerned about or what we can help work, uh, work with you on. Oh, I think it's essential. It's not just important, it's essential because our form of government is a representative democracy and we cannot adequately represent the people who send us here if we don't know what they're thinking. So I think it is absolutely essential to good government. Oh, we're, I mean, we, we're just extension to the people uh, and, and we have to be open, we have to be available, we have to be you know, conversational, uh, we've got to listen to ideas. We we like or dislike but we have to accept them for what they are because that's that's the reality of the of the place that we live in and and it's just so essential that uh, each and every one of us as, as leaders if you will whatever that means uh, recognize that and, and and accept it for what it is we are we are public servants and let us never forget that 
because we do everything based on what people think. And um, this is the great Minnesota get together. And I'm not even sure if people know we're back here, but we do get, we do get uh, you know, quite a few people coming by and filling out the forms. But um, I think it's, it's important to find out what people are, 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 are thinking about politics, what they're thinking about taxes, what they're thinking about education, what they're thinking about the, all the things that we cover. And incidentally, there's nothing you do in your life that we don't touch. And so, um, so people should probably come back to the booth and say hi to us and, uh, and give us their opinions because um, every now and then we get some really, really good ideas at these places and things that we never even thought of or that nobody else has brought to us and that need to be, um, that need to be hashed over. So um, we, we, uh, well, the lawmaking process is a very, very deliberative process and it's intentionally done so so that, it, so that laws can't be changed willy-nilly and that they have to be changed with some thought behind them and, and with some uh, information behind the changes that people propose. And so um, hearing from people and then hearing from more people is a really good way to be able to decide whether or not something should be done. In today's technology-based social media world, what is the best way for somebody to communicate with their legislator? What works best for you? Well, the quickest way is an email, and I respond to my own email. So if you respond to me at 8 in the morning, you're probably going to hear back from me more immediately. If you send it through the mail, it takes a little bit longer, um, but we'll still process and respond. And I would just say the best one is the one that works for you. If you're a letter writer, don't worry about a word processor or a typewriter. Just write your story, write your thoughts. We love it. Handwriting these days is so precious. Uh, but really, whatever works for you, texting, emailing, Facebooking, whatever it is, uh, just let us know. Catch me in the grocery store. That's a, that's a very popular place. I like email because um, I can reply at any time, uh, whether it's midnight or 1 a.m. or 6 a.m., it doesn't matter. Um, and also allows me to keep a good record uh, of our conversation. And it also allows me to uh, get that information to the needed researcher or department uh, that really might need to put some input on that. So I, I like email. Um, I also like, I use all forms. I have Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, email, few cell phone numbers. Uh, so all of those ways are great, but really for constituent service, email's the very best. You know, it's easy to say, you know, Google me up and uh, send me an email. And, and we read them all, the, you know, the smartphones and so on, we're, we're in constant communication that way. Uh, but you know what, you know, even around here at the fair, you know, tap me on the shoulder uh, and, uh, and let's talk because eye to eye, face to face, skin to skin is, uh, is always more personal and better. The truth is, is that there's so many ways to talk to us now that uh, whatever works for somebody is the best way to do it. Um, I, I'm one of those who uh, is uh, a little partial to email, uh, but there's younger legislators are probably tweeting and, and doing Facebook and, um, and uh, um, the telephone always works. I call back everybody who asks me to call them back. So, you know, um, there, we get a real lot of uh, feedback from um, organized uh, lobbying. In other words, uh, somebody sends out a big blast of, of information to a, a group of constituents and then they in turn feed it back to us. So that kind of stuff probably isn't as effective as if you write me a letter or if you send me a personal email or if you call me or, or if you stop me outside the Capitol or call me at my house. You know, so there's, there's a lot of ways to communicate. Senator Dave Senjum was recently overseas. We sat down with him to find out what he learned and how Minnesota can benefit. This past summer, I've been uh, privileged, if you will, to, uh, to actually uh, go to Germany twice. Uh, one which uh, dealt with, and by the way, these, these trips are sponsored by the German government through the University of Minnesota. And individuals are selected based on interest and so on. But one has to do with renewable energy, and that's you know kind of been a, a long-term interest. Uh, our area of the state, my area of the state, is very involved in in renewable energy from the standpoint of wind turbines and things like that, solar and so on. Uh, the other though had to do with uh, workforce, workforce development, which is uh, and looking at the German model, which is something they call the dual system, and it's it's a little bit different uh, from our from our approach to things. Uh, what they do, and particularly those involved in technical areas is that they will uh, put forward, working with the businesses, they will put forward a program and have a program wherein uh, students uh, not only 
do, if you will, on-the-job training seats three or four days a week within a company under a contract, but also then maybe the fourth day or third day or maybe third and fourth go to a, a school and learn the, the academic part of their job. And they'll do that for three or four years depending on the program, and then they'll get this certificate which allows them to take that skill that they've learned within the company and within the classroom uh, anywhere, I guess probably on earth, but certainly within Germany. And, uh, and so they end up school with very little debt because they're making money as they, as they uh, are, are getting their education. Uh, they probably get a, 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 a better practical experience than our students. Yeah. And frankly, the employers get a chance to look at these individuals and decide if they want to keep them long term, and usually they do. Uh, so it's a very interesting kind of compelling system, I think. Uh, whether it could work here, uh, I don't know, but it's something I think we ought to look at, and particularly in my area of the state. Uh, Rochester with Destination Medical Center is going to have huge employment needs going forward. Huge, absolutely huge. Not only those retiring, but you know, adding 30,000 jobs to a, a major industry already. Uh, and so workforce is going to be probably, you know, we can build buildings and so on, but we've, all, we've also got to build workforce. And uh, this is uh, at least one different way to approach it. Now the 2013 legislature allocated a lot of money towards solar. Did you learn anything when you were over in Germany that you can perhaps craft into legislation for 2014? Uh, not personally yet. Uh, and, and probably not particularly in the area of solar. Uh, Germany is strong on, on wind, uh, very strong on wind. Uh, the, for me at least, uh, the efficiency rates of solar really aren't there yet. The wind at least uh, will blow 24 hours a day sometimes. Sun, sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day in, in Minnesota or a lot of places on Earth. So I think that's a little more problematic, but uh, and one of the issues with solar, of course, is you have to store the energy someplace. It, otherwise, it just it's just lost. Same with, frankly, wind turbines. But, but and so that that kind of technology is involving. We saw some things in Germany where they store this energy in hot water and things like that, which are, I think, pretty innovative and uh, uh, some things to think about. Uh, I'm not sure that we're ready necessarily to go forward with legislation at this point. We probably have enough. I think we need to let that roll out. But. Uh, but I think Germany's, what I, what I probably learned and, uh, is, is, is what a, uh, a body politic can do if they're committed to a certain direction. And that's, in, in the case of Germany, committed to, frankly, getting rid of nuclear energy, which, from my perspective, is, is pretty outrageous. But yet, they're committed to do that. and. The more I see of what they're doing and kind of understanding what they're doing, you can see the, you know, the power of the young people and, and their appetite towards moving away from that kind of technology and, and going to something more renewable and, and uh, their care and attention for, for Mother Earth. And that wraps up this week's Capitol Report from here at the State Fair. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.